I tell you, music is one of God's tools that uh, is used to get the, the stuff deep down, maybe down where the soul is, alive. You know what I mean? I went to a concert last week. Actually, yeah, last week. And uh, old buddy guy, 77 years old, singing the blues. And I thought, look at that old rascal. And then I thought, hey, you're older than he is, you know. <laughs> but he still knows how to bring the, the goosebumps up. And, and God uses that medium, that vehicle, to, to, to get us thinking about something new and alive and exciting. This church, and I've known about this church since 1980 when I first came here, uh, is, is poised to explode. Do you know that? Psalm 39.4, I want to uh, share something that is pretty, 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 pretty close to all of us. Show me, Lord, my life's end. Ha! You really want to pray that prayer? <laughs> Show me my life's end and the number of my days for, and let me know, how fleeting my life is. We don't, we don't like to think about that. Do you? When I was 30 years old, 40 years old, out here running a jet ski on Lake Conway or skating down on Hollywood Beach boardwalk, I, I thought, man, this is great. I'm, I'm, I'm going to live forever. I, just, I never gave it a thought. I get old, now here I am. Y'all know what this is? What is that? It's a baby blanket. All of us, at one time in our lives, were babies. You don't remember when you were a baby, nor do I. How many of you can remember, raise your hand, when you were four years old? No, are you kidding me? I can too. Anybody three years old? give you a lie detector. I know. <laughs> well, I'm glad you can remember that because babies remind us of new life. And God gives new life. And then we read Psalm 139 that says, God, let me know how long I'm going to live, the number of my days. I don't want to know that to you. This is, y'all know what this is, right? This is an hourglass, this is show and tell day. This is hourglass. Only that's not an hour's worth of sand, it's about 15 minutes. But today, right now, I turn it over and none of us can resurrect what happened 10 seconds ago, can we? No, I mean, you guys watching by the internet, you, you can zip us back, but you can't, we can't go back and change anything that happened 10 seconds ago. And we've already lived another minute. I don't think God wants us to live in a state of fear. I think fear is a tool of the devil and Satan uses it so often to corrupt and uh, dismantle our witness for Christ. But fear is a good thing because it drives the stock market. And when I see it go up or I see it go down, if I'm smart, I'm making money. <laughs> but that hideous fear of what can happen, what, what's going to happen? Over time, our choices determine what 
quality of life we have. And you all know that, right? We call it a choice drama life, choice drama. I have a choice drama. I have cho make choices all day long. And the choices I make will determine my allegiance to God or my disobedience to God so often. You know that? Have you been on it where you feel, hey, maybe I should uh, say something? And I'm not religious. God help us. Don't, you know, all that religious jargon uh, turns people off. But just say something nice, something that might uh, help a person or make them feel better, kindness. And we didn't do it, and then we feel bad about it later. Gilly, you know, I have to repent a lot. Uh, maybe you don't, but I, I'm, I'm a repenter. <laughs> I, I think so many times I should have done that. And I, I, I didn't do it. You know, if you ask a person, and I've done this, ask a person who's in, is, their life is jammed up with bad stuff, okay? And you ask that person, what, what choices in your life did you make that caused this horrendous life that you're living, this lifestyle? So often, too often, they will say, oh, I had a set of parents that just weren't worth, but no good, no good parents. Or I had, uh, I lived in a, a terrible area of town. So I ask you, were you born with a silver spoon in your mouth or were you born with a plastic spoon in your mouth? How many were born with a silver spoon? No, come on, somebody must have. I guess we're all plastics, huh? Plastics Christians. Not many people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And so it's never an excuse for the dilemmas we find ourselves in as to our environment or what other people have done or have not done to us or for us, but it's simply a matter of choice. It's a choice syndrome, making the right choice. Scripture in James 4 brings uh, some truth home to us about, to oh, you see that green sand? We can't go back. Life is fleeting. James, why do, you, why do you not even know what will happen today or tomorrow? You don't know what will happen today or tomorrow. <clears throat> what is your life? You're a mist, a wisp of smoke that appears for a little while and then it's gone. And brother, I can tell you that's so true. It seems like just yesterday that I was planning my mango trees down in Pony Garden. And my mango trees right now are higher than the house. And they have mangoes on that'll make you drool. Oh my God, how many like mangoes? Good mangoes? Oh, I, I got these hybrid trees as babies from the islands and, and put them in the ground and now they're huge. But it seems like just yesterday and I'm thinking up here, well, maybe I can grow some mangoes here in Orlando. It, it, you know, it gets cold sometimes. You have to kind of baby the tree alone. But then I think of where I'm at in life, late spring. Uh, <laughs> and I wonder about those mango trees. I'm not sure, sure what, what to do about that. But these decisions that I've talked about <clears throat> that can either make us or break us. I'll give you a couple examples. My wife, God bless her soul, is right over there. If it hadn't been for her for the last 62 years, this 63 years this December, uh, I would be in trouble. And I always try to listen and be obedient to her sensory gifts. So we're, we're getting people for this pastor parish committee, staff parish committee at the church. And that's a very a crucial committee when we used to do that. Now we don't operate like that. 
But I chose this fella because he just swooned me. He's the nicest guy you ever wanted to meet. I said, oh yeah, that old good old buddy. I said, man, I want that guy. She said, you don't want him. I said, yes, I do. And I got him. <laughs> worst, <laughs> worst mistake I ever made in my life. <laughs> that was a mistake. Not listening to my wife or listening to God. An example of a good choice in a bad situation, I was uh, called to a meeting of irate parishioners who surrounded me with about uh, 15 to 18 people. And they were livid, mad, and uh, I think a little confused because they thought I had done something wrong, which I hadn't. Uh, it was set up and then, you know, all that came out later. But they got me in the circle and they hammered me with uh, vicious, uh, oh, awful, nasty, spirited lies, really. My decision was to tell them a few things <laughs> or not. And I chose or not. And I sit there and I listen and I listen and I listen. Finally, after about 35 minutes of this uh, being in the center of a bunch of snapping dogs, rah, 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 that kind of thing, that's what you feel like. I said, okay, has everyone expressed their feelings? <laughs> I can tell you really feel strong about that. Yes, we have. And I said, well, this will never happen again. And I said, God bless you all. And I left. And they left the church. Best thing ever happened. It was like a deliverance, an exorcism. You know, Satan, get out of here. The spirit, this negative spirit, it just left. And the praise and worship began to flow. And God blessed and blessed and blessed. That was a good choice. I, I hope and pray that you've made some choices like that that you can uh, look back on with, uh, with a smile. I mean, you made a great choice because you're here today. And we're about half done. Now, I can go as long as that keeps flowing. And if I don't like it at the end, I'll just turn it over and do it, do it, do it again. <laughs> Y'all have heard the term, uh, my bad. It's overused, like a lot of, uh, my bad, oh, my bad, my bad. But people, they're lie. Most people lie when they say that, don't they? You know why? They're using that as sort of a, a fluffy, oh, uh, I didn't mean to do it. My bad is my bad. <laughs> Your bad is your bad. We, we can't, we can't get, get around the truth on that. My bad is actually my bad. So I, I want to look at some principles that I've written here today. Time will never give us a break. It'll never give us a break. The only decision we have to make right now is what to do with the time that we have left on this earth. We're parents. We have to decide what we're going to do with children. We're, we're, we're in a business, in our life, our lifestyle, our relationship to God through Jesus Christ. As James said, we don't know what's going to happen today. Or tomorrow. So if I were you, I was sitting out there in the congregation, and I really didn't know if I were to get out here in some, uh, set nicely, some vehicle would run me over, and I was to die. I really want to know that things would be okay with God. I want to know it, and 
I'm not talking about joining the church or anything religious. I'm just talking about a faith, a belief, a confession to God Almighty. He said, if you folks, I'd love you so much. James, uh, John 3.16, I love you so much. But if you will receive my gift, my own son, I'll receive you. What did he mean by that? He meant that in our hearts, in our spirits, God, I believe what you say. Please forgive me of my sin. We've all sinned and fallen way short. And Jesus, come into my life and make me a whole new person. If you've never done that, I, I hope and pray you'll do that before this, because that time, the time is running out. Scripture says now's the day, now's the time of salvation. And every day is the time of salvation, every moment of every day. I have listed seven principles, what I call of successful living. And they're all biblically based. Oh, by the way, I thought I forgot something. Concerning decisions, well, I'll give an example first. I had a fellow come to me once who was having an affair. He had, he had two children and a beautiful wife. And, he, and his, the wife came to me and they're all messed, they're, they're crying. Uh, he's, he's got a, he has a girlfriend, so I'm going on the side, you know. And, he, and I got him alone. I said, hey, what the heck are you doing? You're, you're out of your mind. I, I could, could have ran it. And he said, oh, I just, I just, uh, things are not what they were when I first got married. I said, well, you, how long have you been married? 10 years? I said, well, no, they're not going to be the same. The time keeps flying by. And he said, God has brought this beautiful person into my, I said, boo, baloney, boo, don't give me that stuff. God never goes against his word. We never make a decision that's blessed by God that goes against God's word. He'll never bless that. That, uh, that was a, an illusion that this fellow had conjured up in his own mind to justify his craziness. I didn't uh, do anything that would cause legal interference, but I did have a verbal uh, session with him that he probably doesn't care for me today. That's okay. <laughs> Seven principles, gratitude. We talk about gratitude, we think about the money coming into the church and be generous, you know. Uh, gratitude is simply means to be thankful for every moment of every day and to treat people that way. Even these ignoramuses who drive vehicles on the streets of Orlando, Florida. Did you know, did you know that when I moved here to Orlando from Ash, Ash uh, over in uh, Volusia County, <clears throat> when we moved here, our auto insurance doubled completely. Completely. And I, I called the insurance company, which I won't say what it was. I called the insurance company. I said, what, what's going on? Oh, I can't, I, I can't believe my insurance doubled. Or doubled. Well, they said, you live in the most uninsurance, unfriendly area in the state of Florida and maybe in the USA. I said, why is that? She said, there's more accidents. You have people there that don't know where they're going, tourists. God bless you, you're tourists. God bless you, but... <laughs> We've all been tourists somewhere. I've been in Chicago. And I stopped downtown in Chicago and asked a cab driver where my hotel was. I'd been around the block three times with this old timey GPS. He said, right there. <laughs> I was sitting in front of it. But anyway, <laughs> insurance. Be generous with the way that you approach life and 
I, I'm sure that I'm sure that um, every day you're going to remember to be very, very thankful for that day because time is running out. The second one is called humility. Now, I, I'm personally a very humble person. I, I, I am very fearful to get up in front of crowds and speak. Really, I mean, it scares me to death. Here you Actually, that's not true. The, la the larger the crowd, the easier it is. I'd rather speak to 2,000 people much easier than, say, five or six children. <laughs> now that, that's really fear. That puts a fear in me. But just, we need to be a little humble. We have an insatiable desire that the devil tempts us with to be one up all the time. You're, you know what a one upper is? Pastor Scott brings me this picture of this great big trout he caught. Beautiful. I like it. I smile and I say, oh man, I like to be here too. But in deep down, in deep down, I want to say, you should see that snook I caught that was 42 inches over there, oversized snook. And you should see that tarpon I caught down in uh, Costa Rica. But I don't. See, that's one up. People, you ever talk to someone, everything you say, they're going to say something else. Really makes for great friendship. <laughs> Humility. Just be a little humble. Let, let people have their day. You know, Humility is a, is a genuine gift of the Spirit. Number three, optimism. Some people you never, ever want to ask, how are you doing? I had, some, <laughs> I had someone in this church tell me they had a concern about people always coming up and saying, uh, well, uh, I want to tell you about my ailments. <laughs> I don't want to hear about your ailments. I get enough that I go to the hospital and somebody will start literally describing what's going on. I say, who? I, th I, I don't want to hear it. I just pray for you to be healed in Jesus' name. You be healed. But I don't need to hear those details. I don't need to hear it. I'm going to be optimistic. Better yet, I, I always believe that things are going to turn out for the best. Do you? Do, do you believe that? Well, better than just believing that, no that however things turn out, I will meet them with my best. However they turn out. I hope and pray things always turn out for the best, but I wanna, I wanna make the most and the best of how things turn out, however they turn out, right? Yeah. And, and some people would say, well, that's, that's ridiculous. You pray and you, you believe God for this and that and the other. Hey, God's in charge. God's in charge. I can't, I can't go back and get that sand again. I can't go back in time. I can only go forward. Number four, generosity. Generosity. Pastor John got up here and said, you, you folks be generous today and, and give. I believe when the Spirit of God is moving and the gospel is being presented in a church that God will bring in the money to operate. And God does that. How many times have I gone before a congregation in the past and said, look, I need, uh, need $240,000 in 30 days. Could we buy a piece of property over here? And it, oh, they looked, some people would say, oh, what is he, nuts again? Finally, they got used to that, and uh, we bought the whole block. Took a few years to do it, but the money always came in because a good idea that's going to bless people in the name of God, in the name of Christ, is going to flower, and it's going to be successful. 
Number five, forgiveness. Forgiveness. That's a, an axiom. The Lord's Prayer, God forgive me my sin, my trespasses, as I forgive others. It's kind of simple, and like that old boy said in the boat when I, I had him out there throwing the net to get the bait, bait pods, they swim. And I said, you gotta, you gotta take the boat around the front and get in front, and then we'll throw the no. He kept going right at the pod. I said, what do you say to the boy? Ain't, it ain't rocket science. It's not rocket science. You gotta forgive and forgive and forgive. Forgiveness, true godly forgiveness does not necessarily equate or have any connection to forgetfulness. You know, people say, well, you gotta forgive and forget. No, you don't. There's nothing in the Bible about that. You're not gonna forget. <laughs> you know? That guy that cussed me and swore at me. I made an open Jeep going down Orange Avenue and he's swearing at me. Two blocks, he swore at me right downtown. And I'm not gonna forget that, but I forgave him. Because when I stopped at a stoplight, I said, hey buddy, I'm sorry I cut you off. He said, oh, that's all right, and drove off. I couldn't believe it, <laughs> but I haven't forgot it. And when people insult me or hurt me, I forgive them. Now, maybe I don't forgive them verbally, face to face, maybe I can't. But in forgiveness is a heartfelt soul decision Amen. in the mind. I'm gonna to decide to forgive. Therefore, no, I may not forget it. I will let all the rank, rancid anger and any feelings of vengeance, I'll let that go. Drain me, God, of that stuff. And I feel so good. So if you're here today and you have anyone that crosses your mind, God, put, put, Put that on the minds of the folks here. If there's anyone that you have negative feelings for in a strong way, forgive that person right now in your mind. Forgive them. You're worth more than suffering the cancer of the results of unforgiveness. Number six, intention. Some folks I talk to have a, what do I call a life coasting syndrome. It's kind of lousy, fairly kind of rock along. They have no, no goals. Whatever will be, will be, the old song says. Life is, uh, I don't know. The truth is, if you don't know which road you're going on, any road you choose will take you there. <laughs> My dad, <laughs> bless his heart, way, way, way back was traveling through Georgia as a salesman. And he said he came to a crossroads and there was a country store there. And he didn't know where he, didn't know where he was going. So he asked his little boy, he said, hey, son, where, where does that road down there go? He said, son, I don't know. He said, son, where's that road down there? I don't know. Well, he said, where's that road over there? He said, I don't know, sir, but I ain't lost. <laughs> Dwell on that a little bit. And be intentional in our witness, our witness, no matter what, what is going on in our lives, God, I'm sure, not only desires, but really commands us to be the salt of the earth and give a witness. Uh, in Colossians, yeah, six, uh, four, five, and six, 
you know, uh, life is not always smooth and, and you know, ha ha. You, you watch, look at, I look at Facebook a lot and see, everything, everything ain't fine. It's not all good. But people want that, and I think that's probably good to project that. It's better than seeing somebody on there, woe is me, right? But life is full of woes as well as uh, the fun times. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. This is your witness. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer anyone. And our witness does not need to be flowered up with a bunch of religious cliches and, you know, quirks. And we all know that. We say, praise the Lord, and uh, we can say things. But when you're outside, they, they don't know that stuff. It's like putting a church sign out here on the road and put on it something about uh, be saved or be damned. <laughs> and, and the person that's lost goes by and said, <laughs> this stupid bunch of, you know, that's the, way, that's the way the world thinks. My wife put a, a saying once on a church sign. I, I can't quote it exactly, but it got attention. It had a, something about a giraffe having a baby that dropped like six, eight feet, and it survived. And the whole sign was about that. We got more comments on that than we got on anything else on the church sign. We put something crazy on every, every week. And one guy, one guy told me he came to the church. That's what brought him to the church because of the church signs that we put out. And it wasn't a bunch of religious stuff because the religious stuff only is understood by the people who are believers here in the church. Well, we understand that. Tell somebody, uh, uh, you know, give them, give them a, a Bible verse and say, you need to do this, that, and that. They don't understand that. They don't. Number seven. You've been looking for that, right? Expectation. I ask you, are you excited about life? Amen. I, I, I'm excited. I mean, for whatever I have left, I'm excited about it. I, I got to tell you that things, life is an adventure. I, I don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. You don't either. In Romans 4.16, therefore, the promise comes by faith that it, be by, that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, that's us, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham, that's us. We're, we're, we're the offspring. By grace, we have to be excited in order for others to be excited about life. We have to be exuberant and excited about Christ living within us in order for others to be excited. Nothing more. I used to think church, when I was a kid, was a bunch of old, solemn-faced uh, downers. And, and, the, and the hymns proved it. We'd sing, a, we'd sing a hymn with about 14 verses, and I'm thinking, Oh my God, when is this thing going to get over with? I appreciate the music today. I really do. I mean, I, it gets me, I, I love it. Ha, I sure do. Well, I'm going to close with the five promises of God, but I want, to, I want to share something with you. We're told in the scriptures that we have the authority and the power, we who believe, to bless and to curse. We have the power to bless and to curse. I don't want to curse anybody today, do you? But I do want to bless. So I want you to receive your blessing today. 
I have a, a gift for every one of you. Your own hourglass. It's not going to cost you anything, but if you want to leave $100, I bet. No. <laughs> it won't cost you a dime. This gift, I hope and pray, will remind you, as it does me, that my life is fleeting. It's going one minute, one second, one millisecond at a time. And it will remind me to pray. It will remind me of the seven benefits, the seven challenges of successful living that I just read of God. And it will also remind me of the seven promises of God. God never, ever, ever leave us, no matter how nasty we are or whatever is happening, God, God doesn't leave us. God is always in control. <laughs> when I look at the political situation, sometimes I think, God, what had happened here? God knows what's happening. It doesn't bother me. I don't, my nose is not glued to the news all the time, wondering, oh my, uh, the country's going to, well, you know, if it does, it does. God's in control. God is always, every moment, God is always good. Amen. God's always watching. He's there. And that's why I don't worry too much about Anything. I really don't. I mean, I'm concerned about some things. I, I, I'm serious, but I, I don't sit around and mull things over and worry because God is always watching. And I know this God is always victorious. We're the winners. We're the winners. You know what? I've got about 30 more minutes there. What am I going to do? <laughs> when you come forward, I'm going to come down. If you come down the center aisle, I'm not going to anoint you with oil. But the scripture is very clear in a number, numerous places where the disciples, apostles put hands on people. They laid hands on people and gave their blessing, prayed for them, whatever the need was. So I'm just going to hand you this and I'm going to put my hands on you and bless you. And as you go home, you can thank God that you've been blessed today, and you'll be reminded of the time that you have left. Make the very best, the very most of it for Jesus Christ. Will you do that? God, I pray for these, my sisters and brothers, everyone gathered here, those watching by the Internet, that you will impress upon each of us the gift of time and the blessing. And I pray that you will bless those today who are hurting, even in this congregation, and you'll lift their spirits and let them know that as time passes, healing occurs. For we've asked it and pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come and get your blessing.